Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Joshua Stone, who's the CEO and co-founder of Book.io. Joshua, great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks to, thanks for uh, having me here. I appreciate it. Well, Joshua, I, I think it's timely that I'm speaking with you because I'm in the process of writing a book. And so I'm very curious about Book.io and what are the other options for me as a soon-to-be author where I can publish my book on the blockchain and get some additional benefits. Uh, before before we get into all that, though, uh, tell us about yourself, where you're from, where'd you grow up? Yeah, for sure. So I grew up in Oklahoma. Uh, when I'm traveling, I like to tell people I grew up in Indian territory. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of encapsulates this sort of free spirit, unregulated environment that I just kind of grew up in. And um, my dad was an electronics engineer. My mom is a really incredible amateur artist. So I grew up with a very left brain, right brain um, kind of background. And what was your uh, professional career before founding or co-founding Book.io? Um, yeah, so, you know, I got online, uh, my, like I said, my dad with the electronics engineering. I got online really, really early um, and kind of got fascinated with this intersection of graphic and, um, and engineering kind of where they cross over. So... Um, I really gravitated more towards like a product design and user experience strategy side of things. So I actually got my first uh, large job out of out of school. I went to uh, Oklahoma State University and um, worked on the very first version of Fandango for mm. Cinemark. And uh, that was back in 99. And then wow. worked at some larger um, uh, internet companies. I did a bunch of stuff for AT&T, led the product group at... at um, uh, for hotels.com with Expedia and then kind of got more into the the startup scene um, was in a social media startup that sold and that kind of got my interest into the book publishing industry so I actually previously had co-founded an ebook company that we specialized in bulk distribution of ebooks to universities and really large organizations and we sold that back in 20 I think we sold in 2015 I stayed till 2018. And so, you know, I have a, you know, had kind of approached the book industry from a technologist sort of standpoint. Um, and uh, yeah, and then um, took some time off after that, really got just super deep into crypto and uh, tried to, you know, had kind of determined my next startup. I wanted to be a Web3 based company. Uh, that's awesome, man, because you, you have a Web1 uh, experience. Well, you have experience in Web1 and in Web2, and now you're building in Web3. That's pretty incredible. Uh, what was your first encounter with Bitcoin? I'm always fascinated by folks' uh, different stories. And what was your aha moment? Yeah, I feel like a lot of the stories always like a, a, a story of frustration of I wish I, I would have. Um, <laughs> and so I uh, I I read that I. I read the first white paper pretty quickly after it came out just because I was in a social media startup. So that stuff like circulated quickly of like, oh, there's this internet money thing. Um, and uh, and I talked to some engineers and, you know, I'm not heavy engineer. I've done some engineering stuff, but like at that time, like I, I wasn't capable of like setting, you know, I mean, I guess I could have like really went and stood up a stack and tried to figure out how to, how to mine it. But I tried to convince some engineers to to mine it. And that happened a couple of different times. And, you know, it was a kind of classic argument of like, hey, this will cost us more in electricity than we'll ever make. And, you know, in hindsight, it's like, dang it, I should have just, you know, put them in a headlock and made them do it. Um, so it wasn't really until like 2017 that I, I came around and jumped back in where I could actually start to buy uh, from exchanges easily. And I think at that time, maybe Coinbase only had like four coins listed. And so I spent a lot of time on, on like foreign based exchanges and just really like diving super, super deep. Um, and, you know, through all the uh, the kind of ICO crazes of 2018 and the crash. And um, yeah, you know, I, I think I, I really was becoming more obsessed with what does blockchain mean at like a bigger level from a just like a decentralized nature. Um, and like how, you know, my entire career up to that point, just like sort of thinking like what all would need to be re-architected in this in this way of like a, you know, a decentralized blockchain based way. Oh yeah, for sure. So tell us about uh, book.io. How did that idea come about and uh, what are the different services? How does it work and so forth? Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, one of the biggest hindrances in crypto in my mind has always been just like mass adoptability, right? Like ac making it accessible to the masses. Um, a lot of times, like I, I pick on my mom and just say, you know, my mom's not going to use this, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it occurred to me at some point that, you know, all books could be decentralized, like the actual contents of them and be blockchain based. So, you know, a big issue in the book industry, which you'll definitely experience now that you're working on a book is, you know, if you buy an ebook or an audiobook from Kindle or Audible or iBooks, you're not really buying the book. You just buy a license to, to view the content. So you don't actually own anything, which is why you can't sell it or give it away when you're done reading it. Um, so making it a, a book, a blockchain based asset actually changes from a digital licensing to a digital ownership model. And that allows you to, to resell the book. So you know, when you look at the entire landscape of crypto, there's like, you know, less than 100 million total wallets, but there's over a billion people that buy digital books every year. So like by far and away, like digital books are the biggest digital asset that people currently buy on like an a la carte basis since most of music and movies are streaming. So, you know, we have a focus that's very, um, you know, targeted at true mass, you know, adoption and, uh, you know, experiencing the tech benefits. So really more of a you know, web two usability, but with a web three functionality. Um, and then even in, you know, inside of that current licensing model, what's, what's really radical, um, you know, once you buy a book, of course, it's stuck on your shelf, but then it also gives um, the retailer, the author, the publisher, anybody the right to remove that book from you. It's like literally coming in your house and just like taking a book off your shelf that you bought um, or changing any of the contents inside of it. So, our mission really became uh, two things. One is to decentralize all of human knowledge and put all books on the blockchain so they can't be changed or taken away. Um, and then second is incentivizing reading. Um, so really, you know, the core kind of the process of how it works is like we take any media asset could be, you know, um, a book or a music or video. We break it into a bunch of shards and we encrypt all those in storm and decentralized storage. Then we have a, um, a DAP uh, web-based reader, and we also have mobile apps, um, mobile reading apps that basically stream those contents in, re reassemble and decrypt them, and then allow you to, to read it. So we sort of, uh, you know, while we use an NFT and decentralized storage and like, you know, smart contracts to program and royalties and all that, we sort of summate all that into uh, an asset that we call a decentralized encrypted asset. So then you truly own it, you could lend it out, you can give it away. Um, has a huge impact, you know, not just for the end user, but also for the creators, because um, as you, you know, you'll experience with your book, you know, once, you know, the, the, uh, the traditional model uh, on the payment side is very, is very archaic, you know, like you, if you go the traditional route, you're going to be looking at, you know, you might get some small advance, it's not nearly what the old advances were. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's going to be probably a year to 18 months before you see anything, you know, from that book. Whereas, you know, when it's blockchain based, it's immediate, it's instant, it's paid out. Um, so yeah, we launched the platform a little over a year ago. We've already sold over 160,000 books and um, and we've had some books trade as high as like $10,000 for like really unique books. Wow, uh, that's pretty incredible. So, um, and I want to make sure I emphasize the benefits because I know there's going to be people who are new to blockchain and crypto and say, oh, so what? I, I, I get my book on Amazon. But um, as the author, uh, the, there this feature creates a secondary market, right, for the book. Because let's say um, Joe down the street buys my book. He has on a blockchain. He finished reading it. He's like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to sell this. Uh, now, if he sells it, he's making a, a return and then I, as an author, also getting a royalty there? Yeah, absolutely. So, that, I mean, that really is the big difference, right? Is like on a traditional print side, you know, I have the freedom when I buy a print book. I can take it to a secondhand, you know, resell bookstore, but I don't even really know what it's worth, you know? And then they're giving me, you know, pennies on the dollar and I'm happy to take it because I have no way to substantiate if that's what that book is worth versus if it's digital, then I can see, you know, multiple global marketplaces and see what the trading, you know, what the actual trading price for that book is, right? Um, and then every time it sells and resells and continues, like it's giving you uh, the creator, you know, royalties back, which is really cool from a social side too, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, a current kind of, you know, opaque kind of wall with within Amazon and iBooks is that, you know, publisher author doesn't have any connection to their audience. So they can't see who owns their books. They can't market to those people. 
Um, so with this, it's like, it's all on chain, right? Like we couldn't hide it. If we wanted to hide it, they can see who has their book. So then as an author, right, you could go airdrop, like, you know, an extra chapter of a book to everybody that has your book, or you could allow them, you know, if they have that book, then in their wallet, they could, uh, they could get a discount on the second book. Like you can begin to merchandise and do things that are just like impossible in the, the traditional version. Wow. So that's pretty incredible. You, you said you can airdrop like additional chapters or I don't know, additional information or anything attached to the book. That's, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. It can be a short story or, you know, extra get behind the, behind the scenes type stuff, like how the book was created. It could be video stuff, author interviews, like all kinds of additional content that you, you can't get or deliver in a, in a traditional method. Plus, you know, like a, um, social interactivity of, you know, we're building out a structure for, for book clubs as well. Right. So, you know, there's not, there hasn't really been a good solve for like online book clubs. And like, part of the problem is you get so many trolls that come in and you see this on Amazon, like with reviews, right? It's like a book hasn't even come out and all of a sudden it's got, you know, 8,000 negative reviews hmm. in our system. We can see and verify if you've actually read it. So not only would you have to own a book, but you, we could, we could put in place where you have to own it and you would have had to read it in order to get access to a book club and maybe the authors in there participating as well. Right. So it creates a richer, like, you know, environment for discussion. Oh yeah. I, I was going to bring up the reviews thing uh, and verifying users because that is a game uh, or something that is gamed, I should say, with ratings and reviews and it could be manipulated. Now you mentioned that uh, there's a lending feature. So let's say once again, Joe down the street buys my book, He that person, he or she can lend the the book out. Um, and tell us how that, how that works. Yeah. So a lot of times what we say is, you know, everybody's a bookstore, everybody's a library, right? Because if I, if I have the ability, you know, globally to lend out my book or to sell it, like then you could come and you could rent it for a particular price. Right. And we put that in a smart contract. You could either pay it or it could just be like a free thing. And, you know, one party's covering the transaction costs or, you know, in our method, like we haven't really talked about it yet, but we have a token you know, the person reading it could earn the token um, that uh, the person that owns it could read the token that somebody else is who's who's borrowing it is is reading it like there's a ton of different ways to to construct it. But it really changes the the idea of, you know, it almost like uh, makes micro libraries of everybody. Right. So then I could borrow from anyone. That's great. Yeah, because I, I, I think about that sometimes um, I see different books and I'm like, I don't know if I want to buy this necessarily. And I don't want to have a ton of books in, in, in my home. I, I do appreciate physical books, but I do have some digital books, but yeah. to be able to rent something and just go see, you know, is this, is this good or whatever? And, you know, I actually want to own this. Um, that makes sense. So tell us about the uh, incentivization of getting folks to read. Is, is that how the token plays a part in the ecosystem? And if you can tell us about the book token. Yeah, definitely. So um, it really it really does like an issue inside of of the publishing industry, really. And when you start to look at the statistics behind it, it's like, you know, people do buy books and the publishing industry in general is hoping that people read those books. But a lot of times it becomes like just very commoditized. And it's like they're just trying to sell you the next book and sell you the next book. And so when you look at the stats on like how many people per year are reading and like averaging down, and it's like what we're trying to do is build in an incentive program so people actually consume this knowledge because very clear data, you know, supports when people read books, like society, like definitely progresses, there's less crime, there's more, you know, GDP. So the, you know, the, that kind of secondary part outside of decentralizing the incentivizing portion of it is we have a read to earn system. Um, so whenever you, you get a book, you read it, you're earning tokens while, while you're reading it. Um, and we have kind of a whole distribution schedule and like how the mechanics of all that work. We just released a new uh, white paper that details in kind of great detail, like how all that functions. Um, and then we actually have a, a initial token offering going on right now as well. And we waited a long time to do that. Like we launched the product, we launched all the apps, we started selling books before, you know, and a lot of it was just like from a regulatory uh, reason of wanting to do things exactly the right way. Oh yeah. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. Now there was news that Mark Cuban uh, was collaborating with Book.io to uh, release an NFT ebook on the Polygon blockchain. Can you tell us about that and how that partnership came about? Yeah, for sure. So um, Mark was actually one of our earliest investors mm. um, and uh, came on board. And at the time we were Cardano based. So we argued back and forth a lot about um, other chains, which we had always had a very multi-chain strategy, which I'll, I'll say real quick too, like our 
you know, we deployed to four different blockchains. We deployed to Ethereum, uh, to Polygon, to Cardano, and to Algorand. Um, but yeah, Mark was one of our, our first investors in. And so we worked through his uh, publisher and as well with him, created a bunch of different, uh, you know, the way that our construct kind of works is, um, you know, we don't limit a book to like a single book cover, like it can have tons of different book covers. So that makes makes those different covers collectible for different reasons. Um, so with him, I think we did about 400 different covers. Some of those were like rendered pictures of like him fighting sharks and stuff, like all kinds of fun stuff. And he actually thought it was really, really cool. So um, it just gives you a whole lot more, you know, flexibility. Um, and I'll say too, like on the investor side, like Mark's been a great investor, like great advisor, um, lots of great like networking. I think I was a little hesitant, like just from all, you know, what you see on Shark Tank, but like um, his group's fantastic. Um, you know, we really only have two other investors. We have Ingram Content, which is the world's largest book distributor. Mm-hmm. And they actually distribute and warehouse all the books for Amazon. And then we also have Bertelsmann, which owns Penguin Random House. And they're the largest trade publisher. So we've, we've tried to really be selective about about our investors and um, and working within the industry. But yeah, Mark's been been great. And all the guys at Polygon, the Polygon team has been great uh, to work with as well. That's awesome. Um, are there other uh, publishers that you're targeting and trying to work with? And you know, what, what's your strategy? Is it getting them to integrate Book.io as an uh, an, another option? Um, tell us about that. And I don't know how much you can you can you know tell us yeah, about sure, your strategy, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we've um, I think we you know we're somewhere around twenty maybe publishers or so that we've we've had sign up. Um, you know, the the publishing industry is very uh, splintered. There's there's basically five main, you know, the big five publishers um, and uh, they own a bunch of imprints and then there's a bunch of kind of mid tier and smaller ones. And so like, you know, some total like our last publishing company, like we had close to 200,000 different publishers signed with us. So you kind of have to go like some of them you get like in big in big batches. Right. Some of them are just like one on one. So like a lot of it right now, and especially over the last kind of the beginning or or last year was just a lot of experimentation, right? So it was going to publishers that we've worked with before in the past and saying, hey, let's do like a test project together so we can like see what happens and gather some data and make some choices. So like this year's like much more on like the scale up side. Um, We're going to be releasing audiobooks as well. And so delving into that and like how we do more mass ingestion, but, you know, ultimately it's like what we're introducing back in is Um, not necessarily say, you know, you know, we think we'll just dominate Amazon and it goes away or anything like that. It's more of a, a both in, right? Like you could, you know, I see that as like licensing and like streaming almost, and this is like ownership, right? So for the, for the audiences and the authors and the people, creators that care about ownership, like we provide like that mechanism and all the benefits that that go with it. And it reintroduces the, you know, um, just the law of supply and demand, right? When it's digital licensing, there's there's an infinite supply. It drives down, uh, you know, the price. When there's a limited supply, then the price actually makes a difference. So then I can buy a book, you know, for twenty dollars. I can read it, and maybe it's gone up in value, and I can sell it for you know twenty five or something. Or even if I could sell it for half of what I bought it for, I still get more back than than I do if I buy that as an you know a licensed ebook. Yeah, no, that's great. And I love the secondary market options that open up with this new world of blockchain and tokenization. So Joshua, you know, you mentioned Amazon. Uh, you, you guys are certainly a disruptive platform, uh, if I could put it that way. Let's say Amazon comes knocking on your door and saying, hey, we want to acquire you. We want to integrate Book.io into our, because we got the biggest marketplace. You know, what, what would be your thought process? And would you say yes, depending on the number? Yeah, I mean, you know, we get that question sort of semi often, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, I I think that uh, if if the if the situation was right and an Amazon was what you know if if we if it was functioned in a way that like it kept the core model right. So like if they didn't uh, if if the idea was to integrate and like expand what currently exists into digital ownership, right? Like, I think that makes sense. And some of the stuff they've done with like Avalanche and, you know, some of the integration stuff, it's like, I think they, they see that. I think they're a bit more hesitant just from the regulatory perspective to like jump in to, to that kind of thing. And yeah. what we're doing is definitely, you know, quite, quite a bit different, but like, we, you know, we're, we're doing great. Like the, the team's growing in a bear market, like we're adding employees and we're, you know, we're right at profitable. So we don't have any like, 
reason to to try to rush out and sell and i think we're going to continue to to grow and i think we're you know we have a you know community that's that has materialized behind it that just really agrees with the ethos of you know you really should own the things that you buy so i don't see us um selling anytime soon and even if we did it would only be to like expand and um you know continue the mission not to to uh to end it or have it just shelved you know oh yeah i mean i certainly i think you and I being in this space, we can certainly agree this is the future with block tokenization and fractionalization, secondary markets, and much more. It's just the adoption curve, right? And uh, just like Web One had its adoption curve, Web Two and now Web Three has its time. Um, you know, you mentioned Algorand, uh, Polygon, Cardano, and so forth. Are you planning to expand to other chains as well? Uh, yeah, we probably will. We don't have any plans to expand to any others right right now. Um, we've done some interesting things with with a few of the chains. Um, we gave a book away at Consensus with Algorand to all the attendees. Like we're we're doing some other expansion stuff. We're, we'll be announcing some some really cool stuff we're about to do with Polygon as well. Um, so just trying to work with with the chains that we have right now. And, and you know, a big issue for publishers is really, uh, you know, I mean, when you get down to it, it's like they chop down trees to make print books, right? So they at first were very adverse to um, to anything blockchain based, right? When, especially when it was, you know, pr- like when Ethereum was proof of stake. Um, so they, some of them have had corporate mandates where they would only work with a, with uh, or proof of work, and they would only work with a proof of stake chain. Um, so you know, the ones that we've selected, I think, uh, encompass like a, a a decent size portion of the market. Not to say we won't integrate, but like. You know, kind of the thesis on being a multi-chain company is that we really want to be a platform so creators could deploy to to other chains. So we've talked to a couple others as well. We just haven't put anything official on the roadmap yet. Mm. Now, more of a personal question for me and and maybe other authors who are going to watch and listen to this will have this question. So like I'm already in the process. I'm, I'm signed with a publisher. The yeah. book is right now tentative date launch next year. Um, could I go that traditional route, but also integrate with book.io and, you know, have you guys thought about a strategy for authors like myself who, you know, we would want to do both and how would that work? Yeah, for sure. So I think to date, like of the hundred something books that we've done, like, um, a little over a third of them have been with, um, with publishers or with, um, with authors. So, you know, basically the way it works is, um, you know, you, you would just connect us with your publisher and then we work through like exactly what kind of program you would want to do. Right. So, um, we just kind of define those details. Um, we walk through with the publisher, what, you know, exactly how it works. Most of the time, like, you know, we're doing limited quantity sort of collectible type stuff right now, but we have the capability to do like a mass, like we actually just uh, sold a book yesterday that, you know, wasn't necessarily a collectible. It had just a regular singular cover that's the same cover that's on the print book. Um, and, uh, you know, and it sold out in like 20 seconds or something, right? So the publisher's super excited because they've never seen anything like that in publishing. Um, and so it's a great way to drive like kind of viral traffic and like excitement. So what what we found too is what ends up happening. We've seen this like multiple times in a row is like we would do something with an author and then it will directly correlate to an increase in print sales because, People get that book, they're excited about it, and then they go and they're like, "Hey, actually, you know, I want to own both." And so that's actually one of the things we're working on with our our um, uh, partnership with with Ingram is what we call Mint and Print, so that you could just buy the digital and automatically get the the physical uh, drop shipped to you at the same time. Oh wow, yeah, that's really cool. Um, so walk us through the user experience. Um, let's say someone's listening to this and they're like, "You know, I want to go check out Book.io. Maybe they have some books that I, I'd be interested in." Um, is there, obviously you have a website, is there an app and with purchasing, um, is it crypto or, or, and fiat or both? Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, we're trying to make it, um, very much, like I said, you know, web two functionality. So it's very easy to sign up. Um, we do take credit cards. So, um, on, uh, you know, you can, you can buy a book with a credit card. It's easy to set up an account. Um, and actually like the, uh, the, the giveaway things that we're doing, the promotional stuff, like you don't even have to have a wallet. Um, we're getting to the point where you won't, you won't even have to have a wallet. You don't have to store seed phrase. You don't have to do any of that. All of it's like self-driven kind of in the background. Um, and so you don't have to buy with crypto. You don't have to know anything about crypto um, and just making a real easy onboarding process for like, you know, the billion plus people that are honestly just not going to go take the time to learn crypto. 
Yeah, I've been talking a lot about that recently with a variety of folks. Um, how do we make it easy for the next billion people? And like you, I've kind of used my mom and my, yeah, my yeah. dad as an example, right? Because like they don't know that like they see the wallet addresses. They're like, what the hell is that? They're scared of it, right? It's intimidating. Uh, it is, I still have to show my mom how to do certain things on her smartphone. So, I, you know, but certainly like she's interested in in crypto and blockchain. And, and, and you know, I've invested some of her funds in, in it. But yeah, to your point, how do we make it easy for the next billion people have the capabilities, but make it make the GUI easy for them, right? Yeah. yeah. One of the funniest uh, comments I, I got recently, which I won't say who it came from, um, somebody within my family um, was like, wait a minute, there's more than one blockchain? Because like they thought blockchain was like internet, you know, they yeah. thought it was like one big blockchain, you know, which like from the outside, it was like, I never really thought about that. But it's like, if you really didn't know anything about it, you might think like, oh, blockchain is just like internet. And they're like, you know, maybe there's only one. And it's like, there, it's just, it's such a barrier. And so I feel like a lot of times, like in the crypto side, like we're in this bubble where it's like, you know, we're really excited about the technology and stuff, but other people just don't, they don't have the, it's not like, you know, intelligence thing. It's just like, they don't have the time to like onboard and figure all that stuff out. So like, how do we, how do we meet them where they are, bring the solutions and like the benefit of web three and what it actually provides to them, like directly to them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think more, more companies building in the space need to think about that. Um, not just for the crypto native folks here, but yeah, the, like you said, the next billion people who, you know they've heard about it in passing they don't they haven't used any type of crypto or done anything and and we got to make it easy for them yeah. um so what's on the remainder of your roadmap for 2023 um we do have quite a bit of stuff planned so um a lot of it you know like i said you know we launched like a year ago so we're really trying to kind of scale up in a, in a lot of different spots so um you know at the top of that list right now is is definitely audiobooks um, and then we have a marketplace also that we're launching and actually on the audiobook side, we have one of the larger, um, audiobook companies, um, that we just signed with, which is super exciting. Um, they have some like celebrity read audiobooks, and that's like a real growing market segment as well, just in, in general within publishing, which is very exciting. Um, we have a lot of AI tools in development that, um, are maybe more focused on publisher author, like, you know, help, helping them out. Um, you know, continue updating the the reading apps. Um, and then we have some really big author launches coming up that are going to be like, they're pretty massive, like celebrity level authors that are going to be launching some projects with us, which is super exciting. No, oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I certainly, after this conversation, you and I need to chat because of my own book. <laughs> right? yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's exciting, man. And I love the idea of, uh, so, well, you know, you mentioned it's a growing uh, part of the market of celebrity read books. Um, you know, I, I certainly would want to listen to Morgan Freeman, uh, read a book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. So let's talk about the crypto market at large. Um, I would love to get your thoughts on, you know, how things have progressed. Obviously last year was tough, but then this year we saw a surge in TradFi big wall street names enter the crypto market like blackrock fidelity many more what are your thoughts on blackrock and these guys getting involved um i mean i think it's good overall right because i think a lot of times we are kind of in this bear you know bear cycle and, and it's easy to get bummed out um but like a lot of it you know for us it's just like ignore all that fud like there's still amazing stuff being built i think with the blackrock stuff in particular it's like I feel like, you know, it is, you know, a spot Bitcoin ETF is is, an, is inevitable, right? I mean, we were talking about it since the last, uh, you know, since the last bear market through the whole bull cycle. So it's like, I feel like it's a matter of time. And I think when it does happen, especially with like a BlackRock, right? Because they have just like incredibly deep pockets. I think we're going to see, you know, tremendous uh, capital start to flow into the market. And I think it could really, um, really kick off a, a serious bull cycle. And, you know, a lot of times too, what I think about is, I mean, there's only obviously 21 million Bitcoins, but then when you look at the sum total number of millionaires, it's like there's 55 million millionaires. Right. So like, there's not even enough Bitcoins to, eat, you know, to give each millionaire one Bitcoin. So it's like, just like mathematically, I feel like, you know, adoption of what's happening from, you know, government and regulatory wise, like there there's progress being made, even though like a lot of it, I think is maybe, you know, somewhat in the dark or not, um, not talked about, but I think the TradFi is, is, you know, has huge 
um, you know, upside potential. I think there will be somewhat of a fight because I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the traditional finance stuff is sort of based on non-transparency and opaque business okay. practices. So I think there's going to be like, you know, some, some turmoil there. Um, but I think a lot of it too is like, we're, we're much more, at least I'm much more interested in just like the kind of real fi applications of like, how do we, you know, how does like real world um, interaction um, and real world objects and stuff interact with a blockchain and what makes sense and what, you know, what, what makes sense as a blockchain base, what makes sense to just keep that stuff, some of those things centralized. Um, and I think we're going to see all those applications grow. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, with that said, there's obviously we've been facing headwinds here in the United States with uh, the need for clarity and regular, you know, like you mentioned earlier about the token and wanting to do things right. Um, to a certain degree, we have some level of clarity, but we know there's still the big question of what's a security, what's not a security. And, you know, maybe having to update the Howey test because I don't think they were thinking about tokens on, you know, uh, decentralized blockchains distributed globally back in 1940s. So, uh, you know, you had the Ripple situation. They took a big uh, victory there with the judge ruling the token intrinsically is not a a security, but it depends on the packaging. Then Grayscale, you know, got a a one there appeal. You know, what are your thoughts on this whole dynamic? And do you think we see comprehensive regulation soon? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we were very happy about those rulings as well, and like continue to kind of watch that stuff. Um, you know, I think I think it's been good. I think we're seeing progress. I think some of the progress that we're seeing just from like kind of you know um, the bipartisan efforts that are kind of happening right now, um, and some subcommittees and stuff is great. You know, I mean, I think ultimately like they're they're both you know with Ripple and Grayscale, I think they're small wins, and I think they're they're good wins, but I, I don't know that, um, like we do need regulation, like you said, right? Like, especially for what we're doing, it's like, we're trying to work with, you know, honestly, like the largest IP holders on the planet. I mean, they hold the IP to, you know, to comic books and movies and, you know, to literally everything. And it's like, so we can't, you know, we try to do everything like above board and like completely white hat and it's very difficult. Right. So, I think regular, you know, regulation as much as you know, we all want it to be the wild west is 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 really good as far as moving blockchain and web three technology into like large scale businesses because they're not going to take the risk if it is unregulated. So I think right. seeing some of the, you know these players move in the trad five kind of side, and, um, seeing more liquidity you know start to to be put in and invested is going to change a lot of those views. And honestly, I think it's just like. You know, to a certain extent, like there's, a di- you know, there's a different age of of entrepreneurs and politicians and regulators that are moving into some of those positions. And like, you know, some of them, hopefully, like, you know, the Gensler ages are going to age out and maybe step down um, at, some, at some point. Um, but, you know, it, it's difficult as a startup, too, right? Because like we pay a lot in legal um, and finance and um you know, like a, a you know traditional startup business. You know, they might pay a hundred dollars on legal Zoom to get started. We have like over thirty percent of our entire like you know revenue is you know goes to legal and ongoing finance. And like we are doing a lot in the IP space, so there's a lot of that too. But it's it's quite a barrier to entry. So you know, then you have other countries that are you know making things tremendously easy and very advantageous. Um, but I think you know the people want to be be based in the in the states and so the the sooner we can get to regulation the better yeah for sure and hopefully uh you know congress can get something going this year uh or early next year before the madness of the election cycle but um you know fingers crossed there's there's some bills in the house there's one in the senate we'll see how things go um I want to get your thoughts and I probably should have asked you this earlier but you know we talked about NFTs tokenization um how are you thinking about book.io in in the emergence of the metaverse one could argue we're in metaverse 1.0 because we're communicating digitally but we're not fully immersed but we'll eventually get there um what do you think you think about that and and, you know could could you and i be sitting in a room reading a book together or listening to morgan freeman read a book in front of us i don't know right What, what are your thoughts and you know are you thinking about that yeah i think so um you know we had actually built at one point like a um a little VR reading app where you could, you know, you could, um, and it was just like a Google glass thing and you could, you know, you could see the book and like we had, um, 
uh, you could change backgrounds and look around and that kind of stuff. And so it's like some of it I feel like is kind of maybe still too early. Um, I, you know, I think that um, I think what I'm more interested in um, more before maybe a precursor to the metaverse is like really like drilling in on like the augmented reality side and like what we can do from like a heads up kind of data display and like how that could could interface with you know like getting like glasses that are like smarter and smarter and like emerging of like technology overlay and data overlay over top of real world is like a, a maybe like a smoother blend towards you know because we we haven't seen you know all of that adoption and just a, a pure like kind of vr sort of metaverse um but i think you know uh, we're making a step in the right direction right of saying like hey you know, media and, you know, books, movies, and music, these should be like objects that you own that you could trade. And I could give you like a song and you could give me a book and like, it is a tradable thing. And there is like a value to that, to that trade and like a transaction that happens. And there's, there's true, like, you know, value uh, within that. So I think, you know, that expansion will, will lead towards some of these other, um, other developments, which is super exciting. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm actually, excited about apple's uh, version of i guess it's like o oculus if you want to call it that and um it, it seems more advanced than the facebook uh or meta oculus so we'll see we'll see maybe that they're they're building the infrastructure to help bring a more adoption in metaverse um awesome i got some wrap-up questions here for you first since we're talking about the metaverse uh if you could create your own metaverse what would the theme be about Oof. um that's tough I mean, it's so it's it's hard for me to not be biased and just say like media, right? Because there's so much I could do to interact with like creators that I think would be just incredible, right? If I could have like, you know, a Stephen King have like a small chat with a few of us or something because I own all of his books, right? Or, you know, or maybe my daughter could, um, you know, have some sort of interaction with a Taylor Swift because she, you know, has collected all of, you know, the concert tickets or something like there's there's so many things like from a, a fan and, and social interaction that I think doesn't it is impossible right now in a web two you know, uh, architecture that is very exciting. And I think is going to change a lot. And I think you see too, from a data perspective, not to just go on this path, but you know, from a data perspective, it's like cells increase on, on media when fan interaction is higher. Right. So because you're you know it's you're you're having a personal connection at that point and i think those personal connections will really bring back this kind of era that we had maybe like in the you know sort of maybe somewhat in the 80s like before just like this explosion of of what we have now where it's like i really i follow like you know particular artists and i consume everything that they make because i'm a fan of 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 them as artists as opposed to just a fan of like one small thing they did Sure. No, that's, I, I would love that. And, you know, you mentioned Taylor stuff. My daughter would certainly love that as well. Um, but yeah, I, that would be incredible, especially from a global standpoint, if you're in another country where you're a fan yeah. of an author or you know, like you said, an artist, but you can co connect with them in an immersive world where, you know, it's, it's, it looks obviously as real as possible uh, mm -hmm. versus 2d. Uh, it would be pretty incredible to have that. Um, and I think we'll, we'll, we're, we're on the path to that, but for sure. got some time to go. Um, all right. You got some rapid fire questions here for you. Favorite food. Okay. Uh, I'd say Indian. I love spicy curries. Uh, favorite musician or band. Oof. That one's tough. Um, not country. Um, you know, I'm very addicted to, uh, to Spotify's, um, friday list where everything you know it's like the new new music friday um i, I really like tons of new stuff one thing i, I recently really liked a lot was a, a band called slater it's like s-l-a-y-y-y-t-r or something like that but you know i have this kind of quirk where i'll i'll listen to a song like a thousand times in a row it's like it gets me in like a flow state and so i will literally just i mean i'll wear a song out while i'm doing like some particular writing thing or project or whatever it is yeah, I, I've done that as well. Listen to us all <laughs> repeatedly. Uh, uh, favorite movie? Um, so most recently, I just watched um, the very first Alien because my son wants to watch it. So I was like, let me give this a go and, <laughs> and see. It's like I was like blown away by like how incredible, like just like the use of like uh, of darkness and like negative space to create what we would now just like make a CGI thing. You know, it was like it was phenomenal like it was incredible that it was made i think it was like maybe like 77 or 78 or something like that it's like super old like 
extremely current, like fantastic movie. Yeah. So that was your first time seeing it? Uh, you know, I saw it when I was like a little kid, you know, like back in the eighties or something, right? Like probably some like edited for like TBS version or something. Right. So, um, so like seeing it just like start to finish, I was like, this is like a masterpiece, like just film wise, you know, it was incredible. Oh yeah. I'm a big alien fan. So I, 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 my wife, you know, these, these wanted the movie. She's like, why are you watching this again? Have you seen it like a million times? <laughs> and it, it, yeah, I'm a big sci-fi horror. Like I, I love predator. I love alien. And so, um, which is funny like i've seen all the new ones right like the the one where um the newest one where it's it's like native america and all that stuff like yeah. but i hadn't gone back and just like i want to watch like the original original you know it was just like i kind of watched all the prometheus and all the derivative sort of stuff and um but yeah it's a great franchise for sure um favorite book um that one's that one's tough too obviously read a lot of books um probably my favorite by far that i usually recommend is the law by frederick uh bastiat it's um it's like kind of encapsulates i feel like a lot of um sort of personal responsibility and just like things that's kind of i think even like as a precursor lead to maybe like libertarian type thoughts and then to like towards like blockchain thoughts and like self-responsibility um but i read a lot like i'm reading another book right now called choke point capitalism that's kind of about um sort of these big media conglomerates and how they have like kind of this choke hold on like what um what media gets delivered to to masses which i think i don't know if you've read it but it's very interesting from a creator standpoint um and then uh yeah i'm reading percy jackson with my daughter and um, that's fun <laughs> so yeah always reading a lot of books um and when you're not working on book.io what are you doing for fun as a hobby um mostly right now actually i have um which is kind of random uh like i said i'm from oklahoma i live in, in just north of dallas texas and so we have um some little like off-grid property up there so we like to go up there and and mess around we have like a, a wall tent and we do some hiking and camping and stuff like that it's a ton of fun nice joshua um i will i'm definitely going to continue my conversation with you about book.io and how i can leverage it uh, really, really love the project. And uh, I would love to have you back on as things progress. But uh, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you.